Step 3, Q Dijkstra, or Quantum Dijkstra. So we said that in order to uh, route a network, we need a suitable uh, cost function. In a complex world, we cannot use something very simple, just a sum of um, how many hops we are doing, because each hop might have a different link cost associated with it. But what makes sense is to define a following path cost. It's the sum of these xi's, where xi is the link cost. So if you figure out how much each link costs you, then you can find out also the cost for the entire path and use that for your routing algorithm. Over here, we've got an example uh, of our simple network. And this is the routing table associated with the node A. So node A runs the usual classical Dijkstra's algorithm where we omit the details and it finds the following um, link costs to its neighbors and path costs to its uh, destinations. For example, if a destination in B, then it knows that the shortest uh, path, shortest in this sense means with the smallest cost, uh, leads through D, and the total cost is 1 plus 7. If it tries to reach C, C is its neighbor, it knows that the link cost with, uh, associated with reaching C is just 2. If it's trying to reach the node E over here, then it computes that the best uh, smallest uh, path cost is 2 plus 5, and it knows it needs to forward the packet to C. Now, what are the questions that uh, we are trying to answer? What are we trying to do with defining a path cost? That's actually not a very, such a clear-cut answer. Classically, paths can be ranked by the following uh, things. They can be ranked by expected uh, path performance or economic and policy decisions that might prefer one link over the other. Often, we can define the inverse bandwidth. Using this as a path cost or link cost, uh, will uh, prioritize high bandwidth links. Uh, if we do that, then it makes sense to define a sum of inverse bandwidths. And in fact, this path cost correlates well with path performance and the fraction of link bandwidth consumed. Roughly, we can define this as the work that we need to do or that the network needs to do in order to transfer packet from one end to the other end. Quantumly, we can start by um, thinking about the same things. We can rank paths by expected path performance. We're not going to talk about policy yet, but before we move on, uh, we need to do a little detour. What do we think uh, happens in the following scenario? We have three nodes, A, B, and C, and we're trying to establish entanglement between A and C. And this double edge between A and B means that we can either choose uh, state row 1 or we can choose state row 2 in order to uh, establish entanglement between A and B. There we have row 1, row 2, and this state is always the same row 3. One would expect that if the fidelity of the state row 1 is larger than the fidelity of state row 2, then also the fidelity of the pair end-to-end -end between AC given by following the path row 1 plus row 3 is going to be larger than using the, uh, these two states, row 2 and row 3, for entanglement swapping and creating end-to-end -end entanglement between A and C. This, in fact, is the wrong uh, answer. It's not necessarily true. And now we're going to show you in, under what cases and what circumstances it is not true. Let's say that our ideal state is the phi plus bell pair, so an equal superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. And we're going to consider two types of error channels. The first one, a bit flip. We have seen this already. We're going to denote such a state with an uh, index uh, x, so it's row x, it's affected by the bit flip channel, and the parameter f is the fidelity of the state, or it's the probability that the state is the ideal state phi plus. So such a state can be written as a sum of uh, the state phi plus with probability f and the uh, Arrhenius state where we apply the Pauli x or the bit flip to the state with probability 1 minus f. Similarly, we will consider the phase flip channel where we replace the x with a Pauli z matrix. So all we're doing is we're applying a phase error to the ideal state phi plus with probability 1 minus f. We might also consider a more general state that, uh, that goes through a depolarizing channel where we denote it with a W uh, standing for Werner. 
Werner states. And again, we have the same parameter f, giving us the fidelity of the state. But this time, we have to sum over all possible errors given by this unitary u, which are just the Pauli matrices x, y, and z. And each of these uh, errors is applied with probability 1 minus f over 3, because now we have three errors. So let's get back to our problem. If we have two um, entangled states, and both of them are affected by the bit flip channel, but one state has fidelity f1 and the other one has fidelity f2. If we perform entanglement swapping uh, at the middle node, then the end-to-end -end entanglement given by this expression, the, the fidelity of that state, is computed to be this. f1 times f2 is the probability that both bell pairs are good, they're not affected by an error. But this other probability, 1 minus f1 times 1 minus f2, is the probability that both are affected by an error. So since both are Iranian state, why are they contributing towards our fidelity of end-to-end -end state? And that's because if both are affected by the same error, the error cancels, meaning the end-to-end -end state is not affected by an error. So the total fidelity end-to-end -end is given by this expression. Similarly, if we have two states affected by the phase uh, flip channel, then we've got uh, the following expression, which is identical. What happens if one of the states is affected by the bit flip channel and the other state is affected by a phase flip channel? In that case, the errors do not cancel anymore. They just accumulate and we get a fidelity of f1 times f2. So the only contribution to end-to-end -end fidelity is given by the pro product of the probabilities that both states are unaffected by the error. Here is a little exercise for you. Can you figure out what would be the end-to-end -end fidelity if both states are Werner states at different fidelities, f1 and f2? It's a fun little exercise. Let's get back to our problem. We have three states, row 1, row 2, row 3. You can also think of row 1 and row 2 as um, resulting from uh, um, entanglement swapping at some intermediate node over here, which is not pictured. Similarly for row 2. And we're going to consider a particular case where row 1 has fidelity 0.75 and it is affected by the phase flip channel. So the state is written as row z and the fidelity is 0.75. Row 2 has fidelity 0.7, but this time it's affected by the bit flip channel. So the state is written as row x, 0.7. And similarly for row 3, we assume that it has fidelity 0.7 and it's also affected by the bit flip channel. So we see row 1 has larger fidelity than row 2. Therefore, we would expect that the end-to-end -end fidelity um, using row 1 is also larger. As we said, that's not the case. And we can see it by plugging in the numbers. If we use uh, row 2, so the lower path, using the state with lower fidelity, then the end-to-end -end fidelity is 0.58. But if we use the state row 1, which has higher fidelity than row 2, the end-to-end -end fidelity is actually lower. It's 0.525. This demonstrates the point that local optimality does not necessarily result in global optimality. This uh, very important result was noted by Di Franco and Ballester in 2012. So what are the implications of this? Well, in single networks, it might be the case that uh, uh, all of the states are affected by the same type of errors. On the other hand, this might not be true when we think about internetworking. So this particular result might not be relevant if we're routing only within a network where all the states are assumed to be affected by, let's say, only a Pauli X or only Pauli Z, or they're all Werner states. In that case, we can safely assume that local optimality also can result in global optimality. On the other hand, when we talk about heterogeneous systems, heterogeneous networks, internetworking, we have to be more, a little bit more careful if we care about global optimality. So, let's get back what are we, to the question of what do we expect, what do we want to achieve by defining path cost. We saw that the expected path performance and the total optimality is a tricky question already. Also, what does it mean to do work by the network in distributing entanglement? Well, it can mean just count the total number of operations, for example, entanglement attempts, or how many gates are we using, or we can count the total time qubits are busy. Or we can also think about the classical messages that need to be sent. 
Remember that quantum networks are hybrid systems of quantum systems as well as classical systems. Our recommendation for the path cost is to use seconds per bell pair at a chosen fidelity as our link cost and use this and use uh, Dijkstra's algorithm with this particular cost function. So this is quantum Dijkstra. These are some of its properties. It takes into account combination of success rate and fidelity. It builds on an earlier network on purification scheduling. It's not perfect, but it correlates very well. The correlation between quantum Dijkstra path cost and path performance is actually pretty good, as we will demonstrate shortly. And also single bottleneck links control performance uh, using this cost, which is what we would expect. Here's a plot from uh, one of the earlier papers from nearly 10 years ago, where it's plotting the throughput in bell pairs per second on the uh, vertical axis and the path cost on the horizontal axis. Here, the path cost, which, which has lower path cost, is on the right, and it's increasing as we go to the left. On the other hand, the throughput increases as we go up. So here, what the researchers did is they plotted um, groups of different links. Some links, these green squares, were very good links. They were very excellent links. Uh, these blue diamonds, they were slightly uh, worse links. And they were called good links. The triangles represent even more deterioration in the links. They were fair links. And the crosses, the red crosses, represent very bad links, very poor links. So what does this mean? It means that um, here, if we only look at the group of the excellent links, we, here we have one for a single hop that has path cost of one. And over here, we've got multiple, multiple data points. That means that they were plotted for paths which had different uh, hops. The hops were increasing as the path cost was increasing as well, as one would expect. But also, if you notice, uh, the throughput remained pretty much the same. Now, as the throughput increases this way, and also the cost increases, so the network has to do more work, then the overall performance goes down this way. So we see there's a very good correlation that if we have to do a lot of work um, on distributing our end-to-end -end entanglement, uh, then throughput is also low. And this is captured by the link cost seconds per bell pair for a chosen fidelity. Also, you might notice these steps in, in the data, that here all of these data points are the same throughput, here they are the same throughput. And this comes from the fact that the um, same number of uh, rounds of purifications were needed to reach the chosen fidelity, which entered into the link cost. That concludes our discussion of quantum dijkstra.